Hello, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to say shiyo, which is how we say hello in Cherokee, as we learned on our second AT Adventure session with Cherokee Elder Gil Jackson. We're so excited about this adventure series, which is geared for young people and for engaging people with all ages. I'm Delia Clark, and I work with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy as a partner and a volunteer. And with me on the line are my amazing colleagues, Julie, Chloe, Alyssa, and Catherine. And we've pivoted from our regular education workshops for teachers, for obvious reasons, and we're gonna be taking a virtual hike up the trail. So we started in Georgia with the science and habitats of rattlesnakes, and we're heading north to Maine, exploring different subjects connected to the Appalachian Trail in each state with local educators and partners like flora, fauna, history, culture, and this week, we've made it all the way from Georgia up to Massachusetts. And we're going to be learning about systems and relationships in nature with Kate Ward and Patrick Donovan, who both teach environmental science at Berkshire School in Sheffield, Massachusetts. I'm really thrilled that they're joining us here today. These sessions are intended to be a resource for educators, students, parents, guardians, and anyone interested in learning more about these topics. So you can check all the ones that you've missed by uh, going to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy website, and you can also see them on the YouTube channel. As probably most of you know, the Appalachian Trail is a unit of our national park system, and it's a hiking trail that goes through 14 states from Georgia to Maine. It was built by volunteers and it's taken care of by over 6,000 volunteers still today. And our organization, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy or ATC, is a nonprofit that works with hundreds of partners like the National Park Service, National Forest Service, and all the volunteers to make sure it's an experience that everyone can enjoy and learn from. And we're so excited to have speakers through this adventure series tell us more about specific aspects of the trail that are interesting to them wherever they may be along the trail from hiking and history recreation plants animals and all the powerful healing that can come from walking so let's find out more about today's speakers first i'm going to introduce kate ward hi kate and kate is currently a high school environmental science teacher at berkshire school which is located in sheffield massachusetts and it sits just below mount everett on the appalachian trail she teaches AP Environmental Science and developed an environmental science research program. And out of the classroom, Kate is an instructor for the Rick Kellogg Mountain Program based at the boarding school. And she also coaches girls ice hockey. Um, she's going to be co-presenting with Patrick Donovan. Patrick grew up in Western Maine. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Close to the Appalachian Trail. And the AT has been one of his teachers. He considers it a friend as well. He's also on the faculty at Berkshire School with Kate, and he facilitates learning that engages land history, environmental science, ecology, sustainability, and leadership. He's committed to contributing to pursuits of social justice, climate justice, and a healthier earth for all. Kate and Patrick have really inspiring life stories. I wish I could take the time to tell you way more about them right now, but I can't. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Kate. Thank you, Delia, for that introduction. We appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us. We have crafted um, a presentation that we have named Systems and Relationships in Nature. And I, Delia really covered our intros here, but, but I am Kate. Hey, everybody. Grateful to be here with you all today and, and looking forward to the conversation that comes uh, that emerges uh, through the end of the presentation. So this is a picture. We are incredibly lucky. We this is the school that we work at. We work at. It's a, a residential boarding school in Western Massachusetts, and the Appalachian Trail runs right along um, the Ridge Farm Mountain. And as Delia mentioned, Mount Everett sits on top. So if if those of you who have hiked the AT, um, you may have you know made your way into Great Barrington. Um, to refuel at some point. So we have a wonderful, a really incredible trail system here uh, that, that's the schools and then it, it hooks right into the AT. We also have um, 
a habitat of, of rattlesnakes on the mountain that's protected and the Nature Conservancy butts right, right up against our, our land. So lots of land, lots of trails. Uh, and it's really our goal to get as many of our students out on the mountain as, as we can. So you might, might hear us refer to the mountain and, and that's pretty common vernacular um, here at Berkshire. So we would like to start um, as we do each year with our classes um, by acknowledging uh, the people that came before us on this land. Um, so we'd like to acknowledge that our school is located on the original homelands of the Mohican people, specifically the Stockbridge Muncie Band. We recognize this land's history of genocide and oppression, and we are committing to, committed to honoring and respecting Native people's survivance and strength in spite of that violence, which continues today. After all, white settler colonialism is not a historical event, but rather an ongoing process. And we pay our respects to the Mohican elders past and present who have stewarded this land for generations and stand in solidarity with those working to return land to indigenous and native communities. And we also invite you to explore further. Right now, if you want to, go to the link uh, and that will show you this native land map and uh, if people wanted to enter in uh, the native land that you're on right now, we'd appreciate that, uh, but no pressure. Um, and then questions to consider beyond our presentation is uh, what native people lived on the land you call home? Where are they now? How did they get there? Who is speaking and writing this information that you're learning about? Um, what native plants and animals were foundational for their food systems? And how might you contribute towards relationships of gratitude, reciprocity, and repair? moving forward. So we wanted to start with this, introducing this quote um, from uh, Braiding Sweet Grass um, with Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, Patrick will reference this book um, a little bit more during, during the second half of the presentation, but um, this, this quote certainly felt um, appropriate as we head into um, into our lesson today. So one otherwise unremarkable morning, I gave my students in my general ecology class a survey. They were asked to rate their understanding of the negative interactions between humans and the environment. Nearly every one of the 200 students said confidently that humans and nature are a bad mix. Later in the survey, they were asked to rate their knowledge of positive interactions between people and land the median response was none. This feels like a really important quote because it really does present the philosophy that, that we use in our classes at Berkshire at teaching environmental science and sustainability. It's really important to us that our students are well-versed in the content, but then also are forming personal connections um, to the mountain, to the land where, where they are so that they're equipped to form those connections when they leave school. And this is also a schematic here that feels really relevant to what we're gonna talk about today. And on the right side, you can see how details, just the connections within an ecosystem, plants, air, water, soil, human built structures, microorganisms and animals. And then on the left, you see the social system, how knowledge, technology, population values and social organization are all connected. And then importantly, we see on the top how human activities from social system, energy, material and information, how uh, we can provide the ecosystem with pieces of that. And then on the bottom showing this alternate goal that coexists of also um, the ecosystem providing ecosystem services uh, to us as humans. And so from an ecology standpoint, when, when we hear the word ecosystem services, it's all those things that naturally are already, th that the ecosystem is already doing that provides us with a service as humans. So for example, um, naturally ecosystems uh, filter water through the soil structure and we benefit from that. Clean air, we benefit from that, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing that we wanted to touch on here too that we'll go, we'll, we'll get to in deeper ways uh, in the presentation is just how language shapes our relationships and our actions and our decision-making. 
And so we challenge our students, as Robin Wall Kimmerer challenges us in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, to think about the terms ecosystem services or natural resources when what might be some other terms, um, maybe their gifts, and how does the, how do those gifts then turn us into responsible citizens um, to give back to this earth? And so one thing Kate and I juggle and balance with our students is diving into the ecological realities that we face today as a, as a globe, as an earth, and deepening our relationships and love of the earth where humans could be good for the earth and the earth can be good for us too. So in our presentation today, I'm going to I'm going to hit the the more ecosystem science based viewpoint and then Patrick is going to take over after that and really incorporate the how we as as learners and facilitators really try to connect the the social system back to the ecosystem and just echoing once again what both of us have said at this point but it's really essential for us as teachers that we do both of those things. So in order to, to do this, I'm um, my part of this presentation is going to focus on balance and equilibrium in ecosystems. And really, um, the, the main point is when we're thinking about systems and relationships that are in nature, the natural world creates equilibrium for itself. It's able, it's very resilient. It's able to bounce back um, and, and find that balance again. And unfortunately, one of the, the only times where that becomes very clear for us as humans is when we, when we do something that's gonna negatively impact the ability for that, those ecosystems to refine or recalibrate the, to their equilibrium. Um, so the, the two case studies that I will present will tie that, that theme together. Um, and so I just wanted to start with presenting, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with these ecological levels of organization, this is really uh, the cornerstone of where we start um, ecology in our classes, understanding that we can speak about all of these topics on an individual level, on a population level of all the same species, on a community level where lots of um, species interacting with one another on an ecosystem level, where we're thinking about the interactions between both biotic and abiotic factors, so the living and non-living, and then biome getting bigger as we go, and then of course, as one whole biosphere. And of course, as I say to my students all the time, we have, we are, the biosphere is all of our home. And um, at this point, we're not able to, to just pick up and, and leave it. Um, so we certainly have a responsibility to, to care for it properly. The first case study that I wanted to walk through as my example of, of system in nature, and there are many, many that uh, endless that I, I could have chose, but I chose to, to share the carbon cycle really primarily because it, uh, I think it's essential that everyone understands this, this cycle. And when we're talking about um, global climate change, it's, uh, it's very important that we're able to identify what the science and be able to articulate the science behind that. So that being said, carbon is the, the molecule of life. All life is carbon based. And, and there are four main um, reservoirs that carbon uh, is held in an ecosystem. The atmosphere, plants and animals, or biota, the ocean, soil, and I also probably should have added fossil fuels as well to this one, All right? And so I'm gonna actually exit out of this presentation real quick oh, and move to my fancy whiteboard to draw this out um, for everyone. Awesome, so I have taken my reservoirs from a carbon cycle and drawn this um, on, or and put some pictures on this whiteboard, which it should go, go without saying that Patrick and I have been spending some time on Zoom. Our students are currently here now, but they, we, we do have um, lots of, uh, we've had a couple of weeks on Zoom as well. So it's been fun to learn some of these um, new teaching, teaching techniques. Um, and the whiteboard has been one of my, my favorite 
merits just to be inclusive of our, our online and in-person learners. But um, that aside, this is the carbon cycle and I have my, my reservoirs or the reservoirs on here. So the atmosphere, ocean, fossil fuels, rocks, and then bi biota, which is just our plants and animals. All right, and so thinking about how carbon naturally moves through this system and starting from that, from the, the natural viewpoint, um, we know that there is an exchange between plants and animals and the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis and respiration. And I'm actually gonna pull our photosynthesis equation over here for those who need a reminder from high school if you're not in high school, um, because this becomes a really important part of, of this cycle here. All right, we also have um, an exchange between the, the atmosphere and the ocean. And so um, through the process of, of diffusion, carbon's moving into the ocean and then also back to the atmosphere. We have lots of carbon that is stored in rock. And in order for carbon to, to be stored in rock or be stored in fossil fuels, over time, we have the process of, of sedimentation and then burial. And we can you know, have two different storage systems as part of that. Obviously, that's a very, very, very slow process. Fossil fuels are carbon-based molecules. So, you know, living things, things that were once living that over as our, our plates move, plates subducted, lots of time and pressure, those have created fossil fuels. So your coal, your oil, and your gas. We also, of course, always are gonna have carbon that moves through trophic structures. So your producers, this is probably gonna be very messy. Consumers, decomposers. Producers, consumers, decomposers, right? So when, <laughs> brutal, uh, when, uh, you know, we eat plants, right? We're, we are intaking the, those, the, that carbon backbone. So having our, our cycle, it's important to recognize, right? As our example of a, of a system that this cycle happens, uh, carbon cycles naturally in our ecosystem, right? And, the way that we are seeing the shift in how carbon um, is cycling is one, we have the extraction and then combustion of fossil fuels. So this should be a very dark cloud and pretend it's a dark cloud. Um, that's releasing a lot into the atmosphere. We also, are seeing, um, you know, really unprecedented levels of deforestation. And at, the reason that I have this photosynthesis um, equation here is it, it's, rec it's important to recognize that uh, we know, right, that, that trees are taking in that CO2 and that water in order to store it as glucose, C6H12O6, and, and then produce oxygen for animals, which is really important, right? This carbon molecule here, right, is because it's stored as glucose, is going to be stored in the tree. And so when we are cutting down massive tracts of forest land, a, a more simplified way that we can think about the carbon cycle is um, we have our large storage tank or reservoir in the atmosphere and then an exchange between plants and animals through photosynthesis and respiration and then this exchange from between fossil fuels um, and what what happens ultimately is that exchange back into fossil fuels it takes you know millions and millions of years and so Therefore, we have this huge influx into the atmosphere. And what the atmosphere does is when it, there's too much carbon, it starts to dump that carbon into the, into the ocean. And so um, as a result, we're seeing um, not only our atmospheric levels skyrocketing, but also seawater uh, pH changing as well, our ocean are becoming more acidic. And so when you hear the acidification of the ocean, that's because of the amount of carbon that's being, that's being dumped into the ocean. I highlight this example just as one of many, many, many examples of a natural system in, 
in on a large, you know, in, on our in our biosphere that that we're having a pretty drastic impact on. Um, and this this figure is from an observatory in Hawaii that started uh, measuring these levels in the in the sixties. And then I just wanted to highlight, this is Biosphere 2. It was located in, it, it's still there in Arizona. And this is just an example of, we, we worked Biosphere 2 where a group of scientists came together and they tried to recreate a natural ecosystem inside. And so as a collection of scientists, they were in this space for two years. Um, it was the first place that that ocean acidification was was recognized as, as something that was going to be an issue for us. And the, the scientists actually had to leave this space earlier than they intended because they, they hadn't um, calculated in how much, how much oxygen the soil would be pulling from the atmosphere. And so they essentially were losing oxygen and had to, had to bail. Um, but I think it just highlights the fact that we, there are, there's still so much about these natural systems that we don't know. And it also ha highlights the importance and the relevance of, of research um, and the ability to have research and have data over a longer period of time. Unfortunately, what we're just what we're seeing is that these changes are happening so fast, and instead, humans are forced to back, to try to backpedal. The second case study um, that I, I want to highlight is just an example of um, relationships in nature. And this is a really classic example. It's an excellent example. And similar to, to Biosphere 2, the reason that we have it is because it's rooted in, in Yellowstone National Park is because there was funding that, that was um, specifically provided to observe the change, some of these different changes as um, pieces were, were taken and removed. So if you're not familiar, um, trophic cascades are uh, food webs, food chains. We always have our producers at the bottom, primary consumers, and then it, it moves up the chain from there. And so this, um, this case study is highlighting Yellowstone National Park, and it focuses on uh, the gray wolf. Um, and then in the 1920s, the United States government um, provided permits for hunters to go and essentially kill all of the, the, uh, the wolves in this area. Wolves, you know, for a long time were hated and feared and persecuted. They were uh, a, an important part of Native um, and Indigenous cultures, and they were really kind of despised um, by society. Um, and you can see this kind of like, I find a, to be a horrific picture of all of, all of these wolves um, after they were killed. All right, but um, this highlights a really um, strong example of relationships in the natural worlds. Obviously wolves were killed off and the wolves fed on elk. Elk, you know, didn't have a predator then. And so we saw this huge increase in elk populations. And as a result, um, the willow populations decreased because the, the, we had so many elk that are just eating, eating, eating. So you know, I think where Kate was ending here were the interconnections between the flora and fauna of the elk the predatory relationship that the wolves had with the elk and keeping them in uh, check with that that ecosystem and if you haven't heard there's a a, a podcast listed at the end of our presentation um, called everything is connected and it uh, really does a great job of showing how these living beings shape the actual flow of the river uh, through the yellowstone where I wanted to go into is sharing some examples of the ways that Kate and I, in our curriculum and pedagogy, introduce relationships and interconnectedness with the students that we work with uh, and, and in community. So we pose this question to you and invite you to enter reflections in the chat right now, if you want to. Um, so this big question is one that we pose to our students every year at the beginning and, and cycle back to it through the different units that we cover. Um, but do you see yourself as a part of nature or apart from nature? And I'm curious to know, those of you on the call, does this shift for you in your experiences on the Appalachian Trail or other trail systems? 
or in wilderness, other non-human dominated communities you visit. Um, and to think about what implications might this have for you in any communities you're a part of. Um, so I invite you to enter some reflections on that into the chat and we can come back to that mm. as we're as we're going forward and then what i'll do is we'll we'll come back to some of those and and right now i just wanted to uh share some other questions and invitations to think about um as i share some of the ways that we interact with relationships and interconnectedness um and they're here so what are the varied ways that relationships are present in nature how are these relationships interconnected and demonstrate patterns? How might we steward and contribute towards conditions that value and support biodiversity and interconnectedness? And how might we build sustainable relationships that center reciprocity and responsibility with the land and ecosystems that give us so many gifts on a daily basis? So as we mentioned earlier, Robin Wall Kimmer's Braiding Sweetgrass is one of our main texts uh, for environmental science. And so we start with land history and awareness. And what we're, we're, we're still learning a lot about this, um, but the land history is actually a shift uh, from place-based education. And it centers and includes the settler colonization that's happened on most of the land, I think that everybody is tuning in from. And so Robin Wall Kimmer says, like creation stories everywhere, Cosmologies are a source of identity and orientation to the world. They tell us who we are. We are inevitably shaped by them, no matter how distant they may be from our consciousness. And so we ask students to think about and connect their learning and doing to the ways that we know what we know. And we ask that question, how do we know what we know and whose voice is talking? Um, and so as we bring students to the Appalachian Trail right behind our, our school, we reflect and we dig in on that. And we build relationships with uh, neighbors and other people that have lived here in the past that, that have been forced away. Through the fall, and I'm gonna take a seasonal approach to sharing kind of what we do. We come into thinking about that, that idea that everything is connected in nature. And we use maples, chestnuts, um, as a way to engage students to think about the ways that they're continuing to uh, start grow populations and the idea that in interconnection nothing is really separate if you look at it from a long-term view so another quote that we come back to here from Kimmer is the trees act not as individuals but somehow as a collective exactly how they do this we don't know yet but what we see is the power of unity what happens to one happens to us all. We can starve together or feast together. All flourishing is mutual. And our students make some great connections outside of trees um, into their own relationships, particularly in this moment that we're in uh, with COVID, with lots of other uh, stuff that's happening around them um, in, in the world. From there, we move into indigenous plants, um, multiple ways in, in biodiversity. So these are asters and goldenrod uh, that are right on, they're, they're all the way up through, leading right up to the Appalachian Trail. And they, the, the lesson that we can learn from asters and goldenrod is that they together attract more bees than they do if they're separate. And so we dive into what is the reason for that pattern in nature? Why, do they, why are they mutualistic in that way? And um, Kimmerer asks us to consider two multiple ways of knowing. So moving beyond scientific method, um, we do teach that and we engage it, but also what about beauty? And what about the feelings and the spirit that comes into to these, these relationships that we have? And, and we keep going into thinking, as Kate was talking about the carbon cycle, we, we bring that into soil, we bring that into the geology. Um, this picture right here is Mount Everett. So the AT runs over that ridge. We get different perspectives of Mount Everett and the way that the land has was shaped from a geological standpoint. And then also how it's in cycles, whether we can see it or not, or understand it or not um, over long periods of time. As we move into the later fall, 
the Apple press, unfortunately did not come out this year. Uh, but that is a regular, um, for us and to think about the gifts that are right in our backyard. We have a small orchard and, uh, an apple tree that produces every year. Um, and how can we return that gift? So another quote here, uh, to think about the gratitude that comes in and what would it be like to be raised on gratitude? to speak to the, to the natural world as a member of the democracy of species, to raise a pledge of interdependence. And that comes from a chapter uh, from Kimmer um, called Allegiance to Gratitude. And um, we have a Mohawk uh, member of our community that introduces and, and works through the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address um, with us and uh, in the traditional ways. And we talk about respecting that, uh, what appropriation means and how we might be in right relationship um, with these practices um, and, and giving back. We focus on lichens as bioindicators for air and mutualistic relationships that come from that and what we can learn from lichens. So here's a quote from Kimmerer, some of Earth's oldest beings, lichens are born from reciprocity. These ancients carry the teachings and ways that they live. They remind us of enduring power that arises from mutualism, from the sharing of the gifts carried by each species. Their success is not measured by consumption or growth, but by the graceful longevity and simplicity. And so students dive into interacting with and understanding where you're, there's healthy lichens, you are breathing clean, healthy air. Where there's diseased lichens, that's an indicator that something's a miss in the cycle and how do we learn from that um, not necessarily if there's not lichens it doesn't mean that it's bad air um, but where there there's healthy lichens it means that there is good in the winter time we move into tracking great tracking right now and connecting um, with the snowfalls that happen and how animals move through this time of year into march we move into maple syrup collecting sap boiling and of course having pancakes and then in the springtime, we move into how do we pay this forward? And we work in our community garden, planting seeds physically and metaphorically and, and in the heart and soul too. And so we, through the year, bring a focus of relationships. And uh, the question that we ask around, do you see yourself as a part of nature or apart from nature comes back to this. And that we hope that students see themselves not separate from, but a part of nature and the ecosystems that sustain us. And so we work through what different relationships of mutualism, symbiosis, commensalism, and parasitism look like. And how do we acknowledge those and understand um, if they're in line with our, our hopes and our, our, you know, who we want to be as humans. And then here are some examples um, of the spring gifts that we are connected to and hopefully show responsibility and reciprocity for. Um, most of these pictures, all of these pictures are from students uh, that we've worked with. Um, here are some activism going on in our town, protecting salamanders during their migration season and stewarding strawberries through our community garden. So we, we look to center gratitude, reciprocity and responsibility and you know, we ask you now and want to turn some conversation over to and look to the chat. How might plants be teachers for humans? How might humans remember to open the plants as teachers? And how do one's awareness, language, and practices shape relationships? And we'll go to the chat here. And Kate, I don't know if you want to jump in too and make some connections here. Thank you, Patrick, for taking over. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I guess the last piece of the thread of that um, that would, was feeding into Patrick's presentation is is just the the importance for us that our students are able to look to understand the um, the systems and the relationships of of a natural world and then and then be able to see them in the in the place that they that they are and so um, both through you know through the science but also through the the feeling the connection that they can they can, that they have to the natural world great and then also want to invite questions and comments 
Okay. Uh, well, I mean, the first the first question that uh, I think it was, can uh, plants be teachers? The first thing that just comes to mind is you know, earlier on and even now, plants who are, are you know have certain either healing uh, properties or or other ways to aid uh, in you know the medical field and whatnot. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm trying to think beyond that as uh, you know more what what other teaching philosophies uh, could come out of it beyond you know practical use. Yeah, thanks, Sahaj. Yeah, and I know someone in the in the chat mentioned, I think it was Catherine, um, that one of the shifts for her being the more comfortable I got in the woods, learned the names and roles of plants and animals, the more I felt at home there and felt like I'm a part of nature. And that's certainly a theme that we talk about a lot is the importance of language and um, how in, in our human world, um, being able to name uh, name things, uh, you know, all things, um, is is oftentimes the first step to to a deep, deeper understanding and building that connection. So that's certainly an important piece of of all of it as well. I was just gonna say, yeah, Catherine, you were asking about lichens and how do you know if they're diseased or not. Um, and Kate actually, so I do a unit every late fall on this and um, disease lichens will show some white and browning spots um, on them. It's one of the most populous species on earth. Um, and when you're not really looking for it, you may be passed by it. But once you start to see it and the students I work with are like, I saw lichens everywhere I go. <laughs> and the excitement comes up so much. Um, and Kate actually has students each year uh, that do longer term research. So Kate, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Else. Sure, yeah. So, um, and lichens are so cool because we've we've like shot them up to space and they can live, you know, for weeks without oxygen, but yet we are, you know, so many of them are polluted on, on our earth. Um, uh, yeah, so, so part of my environmental research class, every student in the course um, designs, either designs or continues um, uh, an ecology research project on the mountain. And so we now have, we're in our, I'm in my third year of this course. So we have three years worth of data um, for a couple of, of projects that include um, lichen um, connecting and and um, and air quality. Um, we also have uh, a two-year study on uh, tracking tick populations and um, biodiversity levels, and and making the connection between those. Um, and we also have three years worth of data of how of the phenology of maple trees as the seasons are changing, how that's impacting maple trees and therefore how it's impacting our sugaring season. Um, and, we have a, and we have a lot of other projects too, but certainly part of that course, the goal is, is or the vision is like 10 years down the road to have um, data that we can look to and start to identify some of these longer term trends. And then I think we've just got a couple more minutes and then we've got to pivot, I think, but I'm thinking, I'm so interested in this question about plants as teachers. And I'm wondering how, are your students pretty receptive to that idea? What have some of been some of the ways you've been able to um, sort of op pr promote their openness to that kind of thinking? I'm curious ways that they've identified plants as teachers. For me, uh, the students that I've worked with um, really welcome the invitation to it and uh, working into the experiences of naming, someone in the chat said this too, um, but really getting to know uh, these, um, these plants and not just getting to know them to sort of categorize them, um, but to spend time with them and to see the wonder. And, and that's one thing that's important for me. Uh, I won't speak for Kate, but I can assume too, um, but is to inspire wonder and curiosity in students. Um, and I see it when, when they spend time with bees in the asters and goldenrod, um, when they're able to 
to draw and slow down and get off their screens. Um, it happens sometimes with time, but it happens for sure. <laughs> Well, and we're at a, this really pivotal moment here where we have, um, where we're reliant on technology in order to, you know, function, especially this year, we've seen that. Um, and so many of our students come to us without, you know, w without experiences in nature or getting their hands into soil. And oftentimes, um, just getting, uh, introducing that and, um, and also sharing what they can learn um, in the in in the process of of slowing down and and being away from their computer. And um, many of our students reflect on the value of that in their own lives and how they don't have those spaces unless they create it or if they're unless they're created for them. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for listening. We, these are just a couple of, of resources if you're interested in exploring this topic further. Yeah, grateful uh, for everyone that's here in the AT and um, always open to feedback, questions, ideas, and connections. Um, so please reach out um, as well. Thank you guys so much. And I just want to offer a really big thank you to you. Uh, for coming both Kate and Patrick. It's been amazing. and We've overcome our technological problems and we're able to learn a ton together. So thank you so much. I am so excited, um, Patrick and Kate, about everything I learned today. You might have seen I was talking with my husband about it all during the program. So really wonderful ideas, a lot to think about. Thank you guys so much. And thank you everybody for coming today.